We are in now our ninth edition of our State of Consumer webinar. Uh, we at Suzy have been conducting these webinars since March. I cannot believe we are here in late July, still doing these um, about the state of the consumer amidst this unprecedented pandemic that has impacted so many individuals and so many businesses. Uh, we thought at Suzy would be interesting today to talk about the future of cities. Um, the cities are obviously very much in question right now uh, with the advance of remote working, with the social unrest that's happening, with the economic de demise of so many businesses that really have their central place of doing business in the city. And we thought it would be an interesting topic to really dive deep into what the future of cities look like, and more specifically, the future of NYC, uh, where I personally reside and so many people in technology and media reside as really a lens for what the future of cities looks like in America. And here today uh, joining me is a very esteemed guest. We have Kristen Muselin, who's a senior editor at Smart Cities Dive. Kristen, thanks so much for joining. Thanks so much for having me, I'm excited. Yeah, absolutely. And where are you, where are you joining in from? I'm calling in from Washington, D.C. Um, we're down here. This is where our, our industry dive office is based. Um, but I'm really excited to talk about New York. It's definitely um, a spotlight city right now uh, amidst COVID. And there's a lot to learn from, from them. Awesome. Yeah. And, and tell us a little bit about Smart Cities Dive and, and what you guys do. Sure. So Smart Cities Dive is a publication, a digital publication that launched back in 2017. And we are working to cover the news and trends about local governance and how cities are trying to become more sustainable and connected. And we are writing to an audience of city leaders. So we're trying to tell city leaders sort of how to, you know, think more smart about their um, leadership and then kind of share that information with their peers as well to kind of have the smart city movement move forward uh, holistically. Great. I know you guys have been actively tracking, obviously, the changes to the urban landscape throughout this pandemic. So I'd be really interested to hearing your thoughts on some of the topics we're going to be covering today. Yeah, there's so, so much um, Yeah. Go on. Sorry, what were you saying? No, I was going to say there's so much happening and so much to talk about. So we'll there sure is. There sure is. Yep. So in that regard, we used our tool, uh, Susie, to really um, dive into this topic using real-time market research. Um, we conducted a study on July 14th uh, with a sample size of 1,000 Americans. Uh, all the questions were targeted to people living in metropolitan areas with the 50-50 gender split. So we really wanted to speak to a base of consumers through our Suzy tool to really try to identify some new insights and figure out what people are thinking and feeling as it relates to their future in their individual city that they're living in. We also did a ton of third-party research, especially as it relates to the New York City metropolitan area. And again, today we're really talking about the future of New York City. And, you know, New York City is big. Just looking at this graph alone shows how big New York City is in terms of uh, the population and that the Bronx alone could encapsulate uh, Philadelphia, which is the fifth largest city. Um, you know, Los Angeles could be encapsulated uh, with between Manhattan and Queens and Chicago can be encapsulated within Brooklyn. So when you think of the biggest cities uh, in the United States, it shows just how very big New York City is. And kind of as New York City goes, in many ways, so does the country um, and so does many other major cities around the nation. So we thought that was looking through the lens of New York City was really an interesting way of looking at what the future of cities uh, in general may look like. Uh, one in every 38 people in the United States actually live in New York City, massive number. Uh, in terms of the population in the United States. And it's also been said that New York City subways themselves are a microcosm of America. Uh, as somebody who has long used uh, New York City subways to commute to work, uh, it's clear that the New York City and the subways are uh, a melting pot of all different types of people from all different ethnicities, um, all different socioeconomic classes. And obviously, just like much of New York City, the subways have grown quiet, uh, quiet during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. You go in the subways right now and it's like this dystopian environment of a completely empty and very clean, by the way, subway. <laughs> And it really is a proxy for what New York City is. It just feels so empty um, in Brooklyn right now. And it does feel like a very different city. And sometimes it's different. It's hard to parse out what really is the driver because we also are in late July. So many people wouldn't be in New York City necessarily right now anyway, but it is during the week. Um, 
but obviously the pandemic has caused so many major businesses to close down. Uh, it's given people license to kind of work from wherever they want to work. Uh, hence, the, you know, the empty subways and empty, empty restaurants, et cetera. But New York City and, and really major cities around the U.S. have seen a massive rise in urbanization really for the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, cities have become safer. Uh, there have become more parks. Schools have been getting better. And while the general path of young people used to be get married, you know, out of college and then move to the suburbs, get that, you know, um, two car garage, white picket fence home and have your 1.7 children. Right. And that's what we saw in terms of the rise of suburban sprawl in the 80s and 90s to in the early 2000s. Up until now, what we've seen is this massive urbanization trend where millennials have decided that they don't want to leave the city. And the cities are really the lives that they imagine for themselves. And in doing so, what we found is that millennials have given up really the space and the privacy that the suburbs have bring for the community and connectivity of urban living. And that has caused obviously massive changes to so many different industries and the population uh, at large. Startups have also gravitated um, towards major cities. And what's interesting here is obviously San Francisco with the tech boom has been number one, but it's been Brooklyn, not New York City as number two in terms of the rise of startups. And that really shows the rise of gentrification because as young people have not wanted to leave the cities, what starts to happen is the livable boundaries of cities have been pushed further and further outwards. Um, I often talk about um, the, you know, the address 560 State Street, which was in a Jay-Z uh, um, song that he raps about how he used to have to sell drugs out of that address to support his family. And now across the street from 560 State Street is the multi-billion dollar Barclays Center, uh, which houses the um, Brooklyn Nets, which Jay-Z just until just recently was a part owner of. So it just shows in such a short period of time how much change we've actually seen. And the gentrification as livable boundaries have been pushed further and further outwards have also driven up obviously the cost of living. But for many millennials, it has been worth it because the rise of jobs and opportunities have really come along with it. Uh, gentrification obviously is for many people a bad thing, right? You have so many local businesses, uh, mom and pop shops that have been around for decades that you know, over time have not been able to afford to have their businesses in these locations anymore because the cost of real estate has gone up so dramatically. Uh, in Brooklyn, over a 10 to 15 year period, you see real estate costs up over 100%. And it really has changed the landscape of so many neighborhoods throughout Brooklyn. It's not just Brooklyn outside of New York. You know, it's uh, Wynwood uh, outside of Miami. It's uh, Jamaica Plains outside of Boston. It's Oakland outside of San Francisco. You know, you show me the major city and I'll show you a, a surrounding area that has continued to push out. Uh, because livable boundaries keep expanding. And, you know, this has happened because young people don't want to leave and they're moving into areas that maybe five, 10 years ago weren't necessarily safe. And now over, you know, at least pre-pandemic, they have become safe. And when young people start to look at what this has meant for the cost of living, it kind of becomes shocking when you look, you know, this was taken a couple uh, weeks ago in terms of what you can buy in Palo Alto, California for $2.2 million, right? The heart of really this urbanization boom compared to what you can buy in Columbus, Ohio. And obviously you see such a disparity in terms of the way you can live, in terms of living at a massive estate in Columbus, Ohio versus Palo Alto. And it's really indicative of the massive increase in the cost of living that has come along with this demand. And for many people in Palo Alto, right, it was worth it. It was worth paying 2.2 million for just over a thousand square feet because maybe you worked at Google or maybe you worked at Apple or Facebook and your stock options and your comp was so high that over time you'd be able to afford a place much higher than that versus Columbus, Ohio that didn't have nearly uh, as much of a dramatic increase in work opportunity. But that may be all changing right now. It may be all changing for a variety of different factors that we're seeing as a result of this pandemic. The last major thing that has really attracted young people over time to major cities is that the crime has gone down dramatically. You look at the, the decrease in crime uh, you know, in both urban, um, you know, in urban areas is almost uh, mirrored what's what's happened with the decrease in crime in suburban and rural areas. You haven't seen much of a difference. But now when you look at the percent change in, in more violent crimes in the last year, you've actually seen in many major cities, it start to spike again. 
And that's one of many indicators that are showing that, you know, the tides are changing and the tides are changing in terms of this urbanization boom that we've seen, especially in the tier one cities, your San Francisco's and your Los Angeles's and New York, New York's, the cost of living uh, that has grown out of control uh, and now the sudden increase in crime have and, and just the, the population density, which comes along with also the risk for the pandemic, have caused many people to question, do I still want to be here? What is the future of these cities? And that's really what we wanted to examine uh, today. So we're going to be looking at New York City for the model on how cities of the future may continue to evolve and really three major categories. First and foremost, city living. What's it like to live in a city? What does it need to be like to live in a city moving forward? Second of all, coming and going. What does commuting and travel look like in and out of a city? And how are those changes or challenges within those areas impacting the demand for major cities? And third, work and careers. How is the corporate world and its outlook on everything from remote work to the importance of an office going to change the importance of being in one of these major cities moving forward. So those are really the three areas that we're going to dive into. And again, Chris, I'm looking forward uh, to hearing your thoughts. So feel free to, uh, I know I talk fast, so make sure that you uh, shout out a few things to say, because we obviously we want everyone uh, listening to be able to benefit from your expertise here as well. Good. So the first thing we're going to be talking about is city living. And as always with our webinars, we're going to be doing this segment called Ask America, where we want you to tell us what question you want answered using our Suzy tool. So uh, what question is most interesting for you to be answered, which we will answer at the end of this webinar. Uh, one, if a majority of your friends and family move in the next three months, would you move? Two, do you envision living in an urban center for the next five years? Three, what is the one thing you wish your nearest metropolitan area had more of? And four, what is your dream city to live and work? So what question do you want actually answered uh, from our Suzy tool? And we will provide those answers at the end of this webinar. Uh, so hopefully you've picked that and we will move on to our first topic. So the top two factors that are going to influence where people live in the next few years are one, where people's friends and family live and two, what career opportunities actually exist in an in individual city. So when we think about how people are going to look at the future of where they live, these are really the two biggest factors. You know, what are my friends doing? People are largely influenced by that. And what does my job make me do or what, you know, if I want to get a new job, where do those jobs exist and, and what is important to those employers? In the near term, a very pivotal factor is what is the status of city schools this fall? So when we look at the future of cities for many people right now, if their children do not actually have to be live and in person for school in the fall, many families who've moved out for the summer, of major cities are simply not going to come back in and they probably won't come back in until it's safe. However, if schools, and, and it, this varies really in, in different areas across the country, Los Angeles has announced, for example, their public school system will not be opening where New York city is actually saying it will to a certain extent. So you're going to see this kind of bifurcation of an approach in different cities around the country. But for those whose kids do have to be in, even if it's only two to three days a week, all of a sudden you're going to be seeing a lot of families for that reason come back into the cities, whether they like it or not, because their kids' education is important. And they're almost going to be forced into an environment, maybe prematurely. And it's going to be interesting to see, obviously, how that works. Uh, you know, is that going to instantly drive some revitalization to cities just because you're going to have more spending and the population come back or is it just not going to work so i don't know chris if you have any thoughts on that but i've often given thought of like how pivotal uh you know the, the education system decisions are heading into the fall yeah and even outside of just um you know k through 12 students going back to school there's also a big implication for cities uh, that are college towns. And if you don't have your college students in the city for an entire semester, an entire year, how does that affect the economic um, opportunities in the city? How does that affect um, just the way that a city operates? And it's a lot to think about. I think that there's really uh, two sides to this argument. You know, you either want to continue this education that students can benefit from in the classroom and continue uh, advancing the economic um, environment, or you want to keep your residents safe. And it's really a challenge that cities are grappling with right now. And we're seeing different approaches across the board. 
Bashar Ahar, and obviously it's become a huge political lightning rod as well, uh, which we're not going to get into because that's a webinar and it's <laughs> in its own. But we've seen obviously, you know, kids going back to school become politicized, um, mm -hmm. and that you know that has obviously impacted the way that many local municipalities have approached. Uh, this issue, um, which is interesting. Um, you know, half of uh, people living in cities saying that they're, they're not going to be obviously partying indoors. Like a lot of people are, you know, right now don't want to go back um, home and half um, are saying that they're uh, likely to eat in an outdoor space. So you're also seeing how people are approaching city living in terms of what's important to them, how, what they think is safe, et cetera, uh, you know, as we uh, perhaps maybe go back um, to, uh, you know, these cities. And people are also you know, more and more concern if they're going to stay in cities as are there going to be more green spaces in these cities? Is there going to be the ability for people to have more outdoor space to um, breathe in fresh air? And I think many municipalities as they're looking at the future of their city planning are really going to have to look at that. Yeah, I think a lot of cities are realizing that the residents are feeling stuck inside and you need to go out. And so we're seeing a lot of cities turn golf courses into public parks. We're seeing a lot of cities close down streets for the public and for cyclists, and also put infrastructure policy into place so that green spaces will be required moving forward if this pandemic were to continue or happen again. Yep, two thirds of respondents agree that I'd like to see more outdoor parks mm -hmm. in their cities. And, you know, many cities have pushed for that, New York City specifically um, on the uh, on the riverbanks, uh, both on the Hudson River and the East River have been building out very aggressively uh, public spaces. But as the populations have grown, the demand just continues um, in those particular areas. Uh, you know, this is yeah, a strong. Uh, Go on. Sorry. Okay. New York passed uh, in 2019, New York passed the Climate Mobilization Act, which will require all new buildings and buildings under construction to put sustainable roofs in place. And so a lot of cities are looking for green roofs, which would be another option for um, just outdoor space. You know, there's a lot of roof space in New York City. And so that's something that New Yorkers will just start to see more of as we move along. Yep. And obviously, you know, restaurants are, and, and other venues where people um, congregate, obviously, are moving quickly to, f you know, to figure out how they're going to be able to make people comfortable and to give them more outdoor space um, in their venues as well. And obviously many people in terms of looking for more space and uh, fresh air, et cetera, are starting to look at places outside the city. So uh, you, you look at New York City and people are sn snapping up second homes. Obviously this is an option not available to everybody, but it has driven up um, you know, home prices in places like the Hamptons, which are up over 21% since the beginning of the crisis, as well as up in the Hudson Valley, where many people are starting to look at, do I want a second home? Am I really gonna wanna be there? Uh, this could be a false positive though, because people might think they wanna be here, but if offices open back up, are they really gonna be able to afford two properties? And what's that gonna mean uh, moving forward? Um, so that'll be interesting to see. Uh, most people, however, who live in metropolitan areas are saying that they wanna continue living there. Um, you know, only 15 percent of the people said they'd move to the suburbs if they could work remotely. So, you know, I think there is a misconception that you do see a lot in the media and even on social media about everyone's leaving the city. Everybody wants to leave. Um, you actually could also look at um, evidence of real estate prices where there wasn't a lot of inventory. So obviously the, a lot, the movement in New York City was down, but the prices have not actually dropped in New York City dramatically. Uh, people do want to still live in New York City moving forward. We haven't seen the exodus that many people have thought, but the longer this continues, uh, maybe that will actually happen. However, just because people don't want to move out of a metropolitan area doesn't mean they want to actually stay in the city where they live now. Right. And this goes back to the cost of living. This goes back to people that are in these uh, tier one cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York that have stayed there for the opportunity, but have long struggled with the cost of living. And they may like the urban environment because maybe they they like the lifestyle. Maybe they're still single. Maybe that, um, you know, that they want to, again, sacrifice that space for the connectivity. But maybe they want to go to another city. And I think, you know, Chris, I know you have a lot to say just about these mid tier cities and what's going on with them and why there's kind of a big opportunity within the, the tier two and tier three cities. Yeah, the growth of mid-tier cities has actually been really accelerating even pre-coronavirus. And now we're seeing a lot of residents and, you know, Americans start to think, where, what, what other city could I live in that has, you know, a lower cost of living? Um, the New York, New York Times actually did a report that found the U.S. Postal Service received 
hundreds of thousands of mail forwarding requests from New York City residents um, that just don't want to have to deal with the rent prices or costs that they're seeing in New York. Um, so cities like Austin, Columbus, um, Phoenix, Arizona, Miami are also cities that are all cities that are starting to see an uptick in interest. And we're also seeing some cities that are incentivizing residents to move there. And so Savannah, Georgia, for example, is giving a $2,000 incentive to any tech worker who will move to that city and work remotely. And so that's sort of wow. a trend that we're trying to pick up on that um, some economic development organizations are saying, you know, come to our city, you can work from here, and we will support your environment and connect you with the community, um, which is a really interesting way to kind of pull people in. Absolutely. And you have companies like Sephora, they're planning their largest year exp expansion in places like Nashville and Charlotte. And, you know, we are starting to see these these big secondary cities really start to emerge. Uh, Forbes recently published an article on the top 10 USA's best position to recover from the coronavirus. And uh, you know you see cities like Boise, Idaho, and Denver, Colorado, and Provo, Utah. One thing a lot of these cities have in common is you know, uh, they are very natural in their environments, you know, lots of green space, lots of access to the mountains or the, you know, or the beaches. And again, really that cost of living uh, being brought down. Uh, Denver being an area I know with the millennial generation is very much in demand right now, just because, you know, you have access to the mountains there and it's a great place to live year round. Uh, and the cost of living is so dramatically lower. And now you're seeing uh, cities like Boise actually pop up where people are starting to say, if they live in Los Angeles, maybe I'll move to Boise. I, you know, the cost of living there is half of what it is in Los Angeles. And if I can still work for my tech company, you know, maybe there'll be an emerging environment there. And in some ways you can almost look at this as it could end up being a blessing in disguise, right? You know, the people who are living in San Francisco or New York City that were struggling to live in a small studio apartment because they wanted to work in tech or they wanted to work in media or finance and could barely afford it, now all of a sudden, maybe they can have all the benefits of an urban environment, you know, and maybe reverse some of the economic pressure that was happening in so many cities mm -hmm. in middle Central America, whether it's St. Louis or Cincinnati or Detroit or Pittsburgh or Boise. These cities were long struggling because so many of the jobs and so much of the wealth was pushed towards the coast. So mm -hmm. now maybe if it can be a smoothing out where American cities can still thrive, but maybe be slightly less concentrated in their power and, and you know, and the wealth that's being generated that may be a great thing for America and maybe lead to a less divisive uh, economic and, and socioeconomic environment. So, and there's new, there's new ideas coming up all the time. This is a really interesting idea called cul-de-sac. It's a startup that's basically building the first car-free neighborhood built from scratch. So basically they're trying to build almost like a Pleasantville environment uh, where basically, you know, your focus, and we're gonna talk a little bit about micro mobility, but focus on modern mobility from e-bikes and scooters, plenty of wide open spaces, uh, you know, everything's at your front door. There, there's um, co-working spaces, obviously everything's super remote, but the idea here is you can live a great life without ever having to commute or leave the city. Now, is this just something that is over indexing on the recent trends or is this kind of communal type environment how people want to live moving forward i don't know Kristen, if you've seen this or if you have thoughts on something like this yeah so i think that this type of environment is how people want to live however the idea of building a city from scratch is something that um so far has not been fully successful um in the us or in north america um if you're following smart city work you'll know that in toronto Sidewalk Labs, which is a Google-backed company, tried to build a city in Toronto, a city of the future. That's very similar to what cul-de-sac is pitching. Um, and just due to everything that comes with trying to build a city from scratch, it was very challenging. Sidewalk Labs ended up pulling out of the project. And so yeah. uh, I think that something like this can, can be successful if done correctly. And if they take learnings from examples like Sidewalk Labs and apply those uh, moving forward and ensure that, you know, cities or residents that would live in a city like this have everything they need, uh, have the privacy and the security that they need um, and all the amenities that are needed that you would get from a city like New York City. Right. I think one of the issues you could even see this in the rendering is it's homogenous, right? Mm -hmm. Are you going to just get 
all the same people with all the same beliefs from all the same um, race, color, or creed, and you know you lack any diversity in ideas or thoughts. And is that really the type of place you want to raise your family? One of the great things personally about raising a family and raising kids in Brooklyn is they're exposed to so many different types of people and ways of life exactly. and thinking. And, is, and so I think that's kind of one of the issues when you create these insular bubbles. Uh, and, and so that's why I, I'm not long on ideas like this personally. Because you can't build culture from the ground up, right? You need that to develop over years and years. And so that's something you lose out on when you have a city right. like this. Yep. Um, you're seeing the JetBlue's founder um, is supposedly launching an airline uh, targeting mid-sized cities in America. So again, this this notion, it could be really interesting to see how this whole mid-sized boom uh, continues. 64% of people living in metropolitan areas wish were easier to move to and work in different cities um, outside of the U.S. as well. So not only are people looking to maybe relocate within the U.S., but they're looking at other cities internationally. Obviously, right now, your U.S. passport doesn't do you much good. Uh, many countries around the world won't even let you in. But over time, um, you know, does this open up the, the opportunity for other people to, to work, you know, around the world in different places? Uh, we're going to go on to our second uh, topic coming and going, which is really about commuting. It's about um, traveling in and out of cities, whether you're a tourist or whether you're a worker. And first, we're going to go into our uh, next segment and ask America, which is which question would you like to hear from our panel? Uh, one, when you have to commute to work, which form of transport will you use? Two, have you invested in alternatives to public transport in the past six months? Three, once COVID is over, will you prefer the shop um, or order online? And four, do you trust that public transport is clean and COVID free? So again, what question do you want to see answered by our Susie panel? Uh, pick the one that's most interesting to you and we will go on. So public transport. Public transport is incredibly important to workers in cities. Uh, we recently at Suzy, so we have about 100 employees in Suzy and have been uh, talking uh, on an ongoing basis to our employees in terms of when will you want to return back to the office? And what we heard loud and clear from our employees is that they miss the office. They miss the collaboration, the human connection, the inspiration that comes with working in an office. But they're not super excited about public transportation and commuting in the work anymore. And one idea that came up is do we have temporary in the fall, that is, temporary spaces in places like New Jersey and uptown New York and downtown New York and Brooklyn, where we can have sub segments of our organization working together in a way that doesn't cause them to have to use public transportation. Because one thing that's clear right now is people are uncomfortable, stressed, and really fearful about the crowds and the lack of cleanliness and the risks that, that come along with public transportation. So that's obviously a major issue when it comes um, to cities. And public transportation systems like the MTA in New York are struggling with dramatic losses of you know up to a billion dollars a year uh, just because of the loss of revenues. So how are they going to be able to continue to fund um, a clean and reliable public transportation system with this much financial pressure that they have mm -hmm. um, coming out of it. So it's not like they're going to be able to flip the lights on and have a better system. You know, the MTA had systems that were eroding far before uh, this pandemic. And now all of a sudden they are faced with, you know, insurmountable losses. So how are they actually going to be able to recover? Many believe that public transit um, should be privatized. Um, and companies like Uber are now um, starting to roll out a variety of different types of technology, which really are starting to enter the privatization of public transportation. Kristen, I don't know if you've given any thoughts to that in terms of what that would look like. Um, and if that's something that could be a good thing or bad things for cities. Yeah. So in New York specifically, there are about 1.7 billion riders annually. And so you think, add that up with the fare that you would pay a day, all the money that's being lost, like we just saw $800 million a month. Um, but American Public Transportation Association is calling for an extra 25 billion from Congress to support public transit nationally right now during the pandemic. Um, what we're seeing a lot of cities start to do because these are public agencies is build a lot of partnerships around the agencies with other private companies um, and other offerings to sort of build this like multimodal system to get people to and from a place without having to be on public transit for too long. Um, the problem, I think privatization could possibly work and it does work in many areas. Um, the problem with that is that ability to sort of form these partnerships and also um, get some support, funding support from the federal government, um, which is, you know, the federal government right now has 
has the money in their hands, right? Like they're just figuring out who to dish it to. And so um, I think, you know, with the current system, with public transit, uh, working with federal government, I think that funding can come in and these systems can be improved. Privatization, I think, is sort of a last resort option for some cities. Um, and it'll just be sort of a question of if the federal government is going to sort of support public transit systems as much as they need right now. Um, I was on a webinar recently where one MTA executive said that they're hemorrhaging money, which, you know, that description really just made me think this is a drastic, drastic and dramatic issue that we're in right now, this challenge. And we really need that support from the federal government to move forward or else we may see more privatization. Yeah. And, and until that happens, obviously, consumers are kind of left to their own devices and will be even more so if um, offices open um, and it's impacting the way they shop as well. You know, 63 percent of people living in metropolitan areas um, used to commute to shop mostly in store. Now it's they're, they're just shopping online. Right. So one of the um, other impacts of people not trusting public transportation is now they can't go to the stores that they used to anymore. And because of it, they're just going online, which is why, you know, you see Amazon with a bigger market cap than really every specialty retailer combined uh, in terms of concentration of power and wealth. You look at what's happening with Amazon. That's really all being driven by people, people's inability to use public transportation. Um, and Uber really could be included in that. Right. People don't even really feel safe in urban areas going on Uber right now. That's really driving uh, facilitation as well. Um, you look at the growth in e-commerce sales, and I, I talked about this in a prior webinar, but it's so important, I'm gonna talk about it today. You basically had as much growth in e-commerce as a percentage of all commerce in an eight week period uh, between the months of April and May, 2020, as you did in the 10 years prior. So you went from you know e-commerce being 17% of all retail to um, over 27% of all retail, just in the period of eight weeks. So um, you hear a lot about this pandemic being an accelerant. We all knew that e-commerce was gonna slowly eat up so many different industries. We just didn't think it would happen this quickly. Right. And now it's forcing so many different businesses to have to reinvent themselves. I think an interesting thing to point out as well with Uber, actually, um, in their Q1 earnings call, the CEO mentioned that the ride segment dropped 80 percent in April. Um, so the company is looking now to invest in things like Postmates, which they just acquired yep. and a lot of micro mobility and kind of moving away from ride hailing because of what you mentioned with the safety issues. And they're kind of moving into this delivery segment. And so because of the rise of e-commerce. And so I think that that's definitely a trend we're going to see. Uh, into next year as well. Yep. Instead of people going to uh, stores, they're going to have the stores and the, and you know the the products come to them. And yep. uh, you know what that's doing. Obviously, it's eroding physical retail. Uh, and you know we had an office up until last month in Soho in New York, and I went to go visit the office one last time because our lease ran out. And at Suzy, we're going to take advantage of the fact that we're remote and not pay rent for the next six months, and we're going to redeploy that um, capital into hiring more people and accelerating our business. But in Soho, you see the stores boarded up, and one retailer after the next is going out of business, uh, and that business is mostly going to Amazon or some other upstarts, whether it be um, Postmates or Instacart or whatever it may be. But it's dramatic in terms of what's happening with physical retailers and how it's really impacting the landscape of cities. And oh, by the way, this is not just an urban thing. It's a suburban thing as well. Uh, you know, when you see companies like um, Sears um, or Neiman Marcus, uh, you know, big, re uh, you know, department stores, big box retailers, specialty retailers uh, go out of business you start to see malls completely eviscerate. And, you know, this is yeah. the place, especially in the 80s, 90s, right? That's where people went to go hang out in malls. Malls have become less of a central place in terms of a cultural gathering spot in suburbs, but they still, in many suburbs, be, it are a hub and they are starting to erode as well. So it's not just impacting cities. Yeah, far before COVID, malls started to erode and I think this will right. be the death of them. That's a that's hundred percent right. Um, so it has created, you know, opportunities for upstarts. This is a non-alcoholic brand called Gia who, you know, up until the pandemic, they were planning on launching um, as D to C direct to consumer. So in the, uh, I'm sorry, with, with restaurants directly. And then as a result of the pandemic switched to direct to consumer and they hit all their sales projections. So the increase in the demand uh, for online sales was so strong that here's a company that had built their whole business about originally selling through restaurants and now all of a sudden 
given a demand, was able to kind of pivot very quickly as small companies, not necessarily large companies, are able to do and really take advantage of that direct to consumer demand. What we heard through our research is the one thing that consumers really miss is these kind of in-store experiences. So, you know, you have Canada Goose who has an experiential store in Toronto, which is still drawing consumers even during the pandemic which essentially allows you to go into a frigid environment and seeing how their jackets are actually allowing you to bear the elements, right? And I think this is interesting because moving forward, if you are a company that still wants to pursue a strategy in retail, it needs you have to have a reason for consumers to go there besides just buying your stuff, right? We saw that through Apple, Apple's retail environment creating an experience. And I think any business that is going to go into retail moving forward post pandemic really needs to make it worthwhile because otherwise you'd much rather just hit a button and have stuff come to you. An alternative of this is we're seeing a lot of retail look at tech solutions like AR and VR that allows for these experiences to happen at home. So we're seeing yep. some companies, for example, have, you know, face recognition, you know, apps. Wendy Parker. Are, Parker's a great example. Yeah, exactly. Just like that. And yep. so that's the other direction that retailers are going to need to move into so that customers can still have that sort of experience just in a different way. Right. Because, I mean, for a while, that was the one reason that if you are a retailer, you can compete with Amazon. Right? right? Amazon doesn't have a store. If you come to our store, you can talk to people, et cetera. Now with the mm -hmm. pandemic, people are even more fearful of going into these environments. So it can't just be about, we have a store. It has to be, we have a store that provides some type of experiences because experiences I think are still going to last long beyond this. People crave Absolutely. human connection. They crave memories. They crave experiences, serendipity. So retailers and, and really every business really needs to play into that. Uh, there's a business called Top Golf, um, which my son um, is a huge fan of. And, and it basically is, uh, you know, taking the old uh, notion of a golf driving range and putting it into a really fun environment where it's gamified. They track your balls. They basically um, can, uh, you know, they deliver high end food, et cetera. They're talking about an IPO right now. To me, this is a perfect business for a company like Under Armour or Nike to acquire, to have that sort of experiential aspect to their business where people can touch and feel their brand. Uh, for the same reason, I think it makes sense for a Netflix or Amazon to buy, you know, a movie theater chain. So they actually can take, um, you know, their brand and actually have it be physical and experiential in nature. And I think that's a huge opportunity moving forward. Yep. Um, so in the absence of public transportation, many people saying are saying they're very likely to invest in their own personal transportation to avoid public transportation. Um, one huge benefactor of this could be the automotive manufacturers. For years, you know, there was discussion that, you know, big auto is dead. Millennials don't want to buy cars anymore. Why would they buy a car when they can just hit a button, uh, right, and jump in an Uber? But now, as more people are fearful about public transportation, it is creating, uh, you know, and really reinvigorating uh, the, you know, the automotive industry. And now many people, especially if they want to go on road trips, get out of the city, maybe they have a second home, all of a sudden want to purchase a vehicle and want to put money towards that. And maybe with the money they're not spending on travel, they can put towards uh, a, a car. And we're starting to see that happen. And a lot of automotive manufacturers have benefited uh, dramatically. I feel like every time I turn the TV on, I see a Carvana commercial for like an on-demand purchase of a car. And it's definitely something that's being marketed a lot right now to customers. Absolutely. And we're also seeing, I know Kristen, you've done a ton of work in this area, just, uh, you know, continued, uh, and I don't know about the business models. We can talk about that for a second, yeah. but micro mobility uh, in terms of people being able to rent things like scooters for, you know, the short haul rides that they want to go around cities. What's going on in the micro mobility space that you're seeing? Great. So scooters and shared electric scooters sort of took off in 2018. Um, in New York City, they have not been permitted up until this point because of safety concerns, um, which really gave uh, New Yorkers a limited number of options and how they can get around because it's either, you know, take a taxi or a car or take the subway. Um, and as we see a lot of residents start to show interest in personal vehicles, cities are now doubling down on their efforts to get micro mobility vehicles into those into those cities because cars not only create issues with climate and with emissions that cities are trying to lower, but also with congestion that is already yeah. so bad in most cities. And so micromobility is playing a crucial role in giving that safe open air experience that's singular and you know avoids crowding 
Um, and New York City actually just a couple of weeks ago legalized e-scooters and e-bikes for this reason, because they were realizing, you know, there may be safety issues with riding a scooter, but there's more safety issues maybe with not allowing this uh, opportunity to have micromobility. And so that won't go into effect until March, but it really shows this shift in how cities are thinking about transportation and getting folks out of personal uh, owned vehicles. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, this is incredible stuff, but a 1% increase in personal transit in Manhattan, which translates to a 12% uh, increase in, in car traffic. So as more people buy their own cars, it could, you know, it, there's not enough space or not enough roads for everyone to be able to drive in. So that's just yeah. not an option. If people do not want to take public transportation, things like scooters and bikes, which, you know, I don't know how much time you spend in the Nordics or Amsterdam, that those entire markets are driven by people, um, you know, on bicycles. And is that something that, uh, you know, and I, there's been talk about there becoming a commuter bridge that connects people from Brooklyn to New York for that yeah. purpose. Is that what we're going to start to see? Now, that takes a big change in culture uh, to, for New York City to go to a biking culture. It's something, talk about culture being developed over years. I don't know if I could see New Yorkers all biking, but I mean, city bikes has oh. taken off in New York. We'll have to see. Well, also, I think drivers are going to start seeing uh, New York is actually the first major U.S. city that's going to put congestion pricing in place, which means that when you drive into under 60th Street in Manhattan, you will get a toll. You will get charged for being in a car, whether you're in an Uber or if you're in your own car. And so that's just going to start forcing people out of their cars anyway, because those folks aren't going to want to pay this price every time they have to go to work or go to wherever they're going downtown. Um, and so to have these alternative options is going to be crucial um, to make that congestion pricing plan actually work yeah absolutely and i mean it, what i think even makes this a tougher issue is more restaurants in, in new york city obviously now they're spilling over into the sidewalks right mm -hmm. so and in many instances you know places are shutting down the streets so there could be more room so how can you have more people driving and yet streets are shut down like how's mm -hmm. the room fall of it something's actually got to give we haven't seen that really hit or impact yet because the cities are empty, but what's going to happen if there's schools in New York City, everybody comes back in, more restaurants are still dining outdoors because people are, are hesitant. It's spilling over to the streets, streets are shut down, yet everyone wants to drive in and not take public transportation. It'll be complete gridlock. You wouldn't be, you won't be able to go anywhere. So and that's where, go on. I would say it's a safety issue as well. The National Safety Council just last week or two weeks ago was talking about how traffic fatality rates have spiked in May even though there's less people on the road. And it's because those people who are on the road are either as a pedestrian walking out into the street because you're not worried about it or you're speeding down the road because you're not there's no traffic. And so that's just leading to more fatalities and injuries that may continue if uh, cities don't plan correctly around these different changes. Yeah, and the other major impact, obviously all of this is tourism. Uh, you know, before the pandemic and, and going back to 2018, uh, nearly 40 million hotel room nights were sold citywide. You know, New York City has for long, long been one of the most in demand international tourist destinations. And now it's for international tourism it is basically evaporated. Right. And, you know, you see Chinese tourists basically go away. You've seen European tourists go away this summer. Um, you know, I live in Dumbo, right uh, uh, near the, the famous Washington Street, where people come to and look at the beautiful view of the Empire State Building and the Manhattan Bridge. And, you know, last summer at this time, completely packed. Now, not so much anymore. Right. And you see the same thing, obviously, happening in Times Square. There's no Broadway. And that's that's got to be impacting so many different businesses. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be one thing that's going to be really hard for places like New York, especially to recover from is it's one thing if you can get your residents back, but if you're, if your tourism, uh, you know, revenues has dropped, it's good. You, you can't necessarily, you know, re-engineer that. And what New York state has been trying to do is get people who live here to say, go visit the empire state building, go visit the statue of Liberty. But many New Yorkers have already done that and really have no interest in doing that. So uh, I think that's going to be something that's going to be, you know, majorly problematic. And think about cities like New Orleans or Nashville that depend on art as their tourism attraction, right? You know, you have venues that shut down, gig artists don't really have opportunities right now. So cities are trying to figure out how do we maintain this so this culture can survive beyond the pandemic. Yep, and beyond tourism, the other thing that I think major cities, have, many cities have to contend with is, uh, you know, business travel. And the lack of business travel is going to create many kind of unintended um, or secondary consequences. Because if you fly from New York to London, right, 
and you're sitting in coach, the reason that your coach flight is affordable is because those business class seats that are being sold, that businesses are buying, that's really subsidizing your flight. And if less and less companies are allowing for international travel and more events like the Consumer Electronics Show, which just today announced that in January they are canceling the upcoming Consumer Electronics Show, um, you know, what that's going to do is dramatically increase the cost of flying international for consumers. And even if consumers want to travel, it's going to become largely unaffordable and will actually put pressure on tourism beyond to the point where there's not demand in tourism. People might want to travel internationally, but they just can't because all of a sudden the cost of international travel has doubled. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another thing that cities have to contend with. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about work and careers, which is our final topic of the day. And before we do so, uh, pick what question you want us to ask America. Um, one, what do you hope to bring more of into your work life post COVID-19? Two, what do you miss most from your job pre COVID? Three, what do you miss least from your job pre-COVID? And four, how can brands make your work life more comfortable? So why don't you tell us what question you want us to answer from our Susie panel, and we will uh, move on into our last section, which is work and career. Uh, so obviously this work from home movement has been real. And it's been, you know, you look at the, the growth of a company like Zoom, and that tells you all you need to know. And the fact that we're doing this event right now, right online, uh, in terms of how much this has really taken, uh, uh, you know, the corporate world by storm. Uh, right now, half of people living in metropolitan cities currently only work from home. Uh, to me, that number even seems low, but I do think some employees are slowly starting to go to work. Uh, you know, maybe. A, couple of days a week or a couple of days a month, whatever it may be, but still half are only working from home. This has now been going on. I guess now we're in our fourth month of this and many new habits are obviously being developed and many companies are seeing to the extent that they're going to be able to shift their workforce uh, remotely. Uh, Google announced yesterday that they're going to extend their employee work from home until summer of 2021. Uh, we announced at Suzy in April that we we're going to be closing our office for the rest of 2020. Uh, a lot of people thought that was crazy. And here we are in just July and you have Google announcing for the next year that people are going to be working um, from home. And you look at that and I, I look at that and I'm thinking, okay, Google is, is letting people work from home until summer 2021, and then it's the summer. So that probably means people will just not go back into San Francisco. Now you're looking at fall 2021. So how soon is it before we are talking about 2022 for this remote uh, from home craze? And now you're looking at something that's lasted, you know, the better part of two years. And that's really shocking when you think about it. Um, you know, and some companies are saying, you know what, we're never going to open uh, offices again. Um, you know, Shopify is saying office centricity is, is over. And I think for many software companies, it might be easier. For other companies, maybe not so much. And then you have companies like Facebook that are allowing people to work from wherever they choose, but they're going to, th their salary is going to be adjusted for the cost of living based upon where they move. So if the cost of living in Philadelphia is only 70% of where it is in San Francisco, you're going to get a 30% pay cut. And that was a very controversial decision. But what Facebook's rationale is, is that if you're going to be moving, um, it shouldn't be so you could save money. It should be, you know, obviously for you to actually be able to live where you want to. Uh, and, you know, are many companies going to follow suit? So far, as far as I know, Facebook's the only company that has instituted such a policy as this. And obviously the company as wealthy as Facebook, many people didn't love that they did that, but that was super interesting to me in terms of them looking at it. And New York City is, is seeing it as well. And they've you know accelerated their internet master plan to support high-speed internet in all five boroughs, making sure that people have the ability to work remotely. Now, obviously many people a, don't have the ability economically to work from home or don't have the proper equipment or internet access. So, you know, the big concern, especially in major cities, is this going to expand the digital divide for people who don't have the equipment or resources to be able to work uh, remotely. 40% um, of people who uh, are in metropolitan cities say, are saying they want to work from home all the time after this crisis is over. So for some people, this has worked out great, right? For people who have um, children at home, maybe not so much so for people that are have two people that are crammed into a one bedroom apartment and they're on top of each other right or that they are stuck in a studio and and are single and don't have those personal interactions maybe it doesn't work for them either but there is a segment of the population that has no interest in, in coming um back to work and 
despite the fact that many companies are now making an optional, only eight to nine percent of workers uh, across CBRE's 20 million square foot of office space in New York actually come back to work. So you're seeing empty office spaces uh, really everywhere. And you know, basically nobody has said they want to come back to work every day since the crisis is over. Uh, only one in 10 people are saying that they want to go in five days a week. So, you know, major shifts taking place. I'm kind of in this camp though, as a, as a CEO of a startup is that I don't think it's that great after all, I kind of never did. Uh, you make the best of it to me, what's missing with a remote environment is the lack of serendipity. You know, you, everything has to be intentional in terms of who you're talking to. Uh, the lack of collaboration, the close personal connections, the ability to onboard uh, new employees who you've never met in person before. I just think it's going to be very problematic for companies long term to be able to sustain this. And I think during a world where there's nothing else to do and you can't travel and you can't go anywhere, it's easy to gain productivity from your employee base. But when the world starts to open back up, are people really going to want to stay in their homes all the time? And I don't think that's the case. So do I think there'll be more of a shift and less of a taboo about remote work and people working from home? Of course. But do I think that the, the office is dead? I don't think so at all. Um, and obviously, that's just one person's opinion. I don't know, Kristen, what you're seeing in this area. Yeah, I think we um, sort of more future thinking, like you're mentioning, are going to start seeing more of a hybrid role of offices where you have employees coming in two or three times a week and you potentially were seeing some offices co-shared by companies to cut right. these costs and to really utilize space appropriately. And that's something I think that's more hybrid model is more realistic for a lot of companies than having either full remote or full uh, you know, attendance back in the office. Um, and yeah, just going back to digital divide, I think it's also crucial to get people in the office due to a lack of internet and resources in some places, though there are a number of temporary solutions being put uh, in place in a lot of cities, including, you know, buses being used at mo as mobile hotspots and cities donating, you know, old computers, but that's not going to last much longer than it's lasted so far. And so we're going to kind of need that shift back. Yeah. I mean, I think... The way I look at office work is if you are just coming into the office and sit at a desk and work all day and just put on your headphones and crank out emails, you can do that from home, right? right. But if you're going to come to the office, it's about collaboration. So when I look at the future of Susie's next office, I want it to be, you know, a mixture of a hotel lobby where people can collaborate and, and then conference rooms, but less desks. Because I think if you're sitting at a desk, you're more working in an isolated insular capacity, even if people are sitting next to you. And in that case, there's no need to commute. There's no need to come to work. So I think for every company, it's going to be different. Um, and I think obviously the commercial real estate sector is really going to have to reimagine this. So you look at what fills so much square footage in New York besides residential, it's retail and office space. Mm -hmm. And so two out of the three major drivers in, uh, of cities and real estate are slowly deteriorating. So does that mean there's going to be a lot of conversion to residential? Right? Are are people going to be living in in buildings that used to be office spaces? Yeah. Uh, as as there's less demand, because there will be less demand coming out of it. Whether you know, no matter what I say and what we want to do, there are certain companies that are going to look at this as an opportunity to cut costs, or they just don't believe they need it anymore to thrive. It's interesting. I'm I'm as we're talking, I'm thinking about the concept of a downtown and how that's also going to change if the work environment kind of shifts into the residential areas or vice versa. And that's something I'm hoping to explore is what happens to downtown and does that exist once remote work really takes hold in a city? Absolutely. Um, so we're going to go to questions, uh, you know, but just in general, you know, and I, I posted this on LinkedIn in terms of why I don't think New York City is dead. And it's, you know, who's not leaving New York City? And it's the artists, the athletes, the musicians, the influencers, the reporters, the nightclub owners, fashion designers, single people, young people. You know, these people are not going to want to live in the middle of nowhere. They're going to want to congregate. Single people are going to, are going to want to meet their, you know, their future spouse. Um, you know, artists and musicians are going to want to be where there's culture and where there's energy and where there's population density, where they can basically feel and breathe the life of the city. And it's been that way since the city town squares in the 1600s and, and on. So I don't think this is going to reverse uh but I do think the fabric of the cities are going to change. And I thought this quote by uh, Richard Florida, um, who wrote this book, A Rise of the Creative Class, which basically 
predicted the rise of urbanization before the millennial generation took hold. He said, the crisis may provide a short window for unaffordable, hyper-gentrified cities to reset and re-energize their creative scenes. And I do believe that could be one of the positives, especially for New York to come out of it, is, you know, leading up to the pandemic, if a mom and pop shop would go out of business, what replaced it? It would be a Starbucks or a Dwayne Reed or a Chase Bank, right? We, we entered a very corporatized kind of sterile environment in major cities, which really started to rid the city of the diversity and the culture that made it great to begin with. Uh, it, it made it unaffordable for young people to be able to live in cities. And because of it, they had no choice but to expand the cities outward. But I do think major, and this is going to come with some pain, obviously, it's going to come with some major losses in terms of real estate investments and things of that nature. But I do think it creates the opportunity to revitalize the city, uh, make it more affordable for younger people, as well as what we mentioned, create opportunities for other cities uh, moving forward. Kristen, I don't know, what do you see as the future of New York City? Um, well, what, one thing I think is interesting about people leaving New York is that, especially now during COVID, we are so used to everything being on demand. If we need something to be delivered to our apartments, if we need to you know, hail a taxi to go somewhere, things are very on demand and not every city has that capacity and that capability. So I think it's going to be crucial for cities outside of New York to start to adopt a lot of those services and offerings of New York City to really be an attractive place for New Yorkers because otherwise all New Yorkers are gonna be drawn back to New York. Most likely you're not living there because particularly of your job, you're living there because of the culture of New York. And being able to mimic that is going to be very difficult. And I think to your point, New York City is not dead. It's just going to be different. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to open it up for questions now. Um, Abel, if you want to uh, pop on um, and maybe go through some of the questions that uh, we got from the audience, and we'll try to answer as many as we can uh, over the next 15, 20 minutes. So if you want to pop on, and uh, let us know the questions we're getting. And we're also going to obviously go through the answers uh, of Ask America. So maybe we'll want to start with that, Abel. Yep, definitely. Um, hey, guys. Uh, so the, the first question that we have here is, do you agree with the following statement? I envision living in an urban center in the next five years. Uh, and I think, um, you know, what we see is a lot of people are kind of unsure at this point. I think 32% of people were neutral on this topic. Uh, and then kind of the second largest, about 45%, they still feel pretty strongly uh, that they are going to continue to reside in urban centers. So I think that kind of uh, does allude back to Matt, your earlier point of, of what will happen to cities um, post COVID. It's kind of supported directly by, by real time data here. Um, the next question we have here is once COVID is over, um, which will you prefer when it comes to shopping? Um, again, I think it's interesting that 62% of people still will prefer to shop in person. Um, so, and about 38% say that they prefer to, to order online. So, um, even though we've seen probably an, a growth in e-commerce, I think probably people are still hungry for that ability to touch and feel and have more of an experiential um, exposure to a brand. Um, and kind of our final question here is, what can brands help to make your life more comfortable? I'm thinking they're looking for support, uh, additional delivery options. Um, they're looking for a different quality, discount, um, you know, technology, things to support their own home office, price, uh, products, and just kind of a general affordability. So I think um, you know, as people kind of go through this difficult time, they're they're looking for brands to kind of jump in and, and help in in the best way possible. Awesome, very helpful. So, um, do you want to? So, should, should we go to some questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, one of the questions that we have here is, what happens in the fall and winter when it's too cold to sit outside? Um, this obviously a lot of restaurants in New York City. They're thriving right now because of their outdoor bars or outdoor restaurants. Um, how do you guys predict that will shift um, if we're still kind of in this pandemic? Kristen, thoughts on that? Sure, so um, at least here in Washington in March when the pandemic came in, it was still fairly cold and we had sort of that idea of what it's like to be indoors all the time before the summer hit. Um, and I think cities, now that they've had a little bit of that experience, they um, will have some plans in place. But I mean, I don't really have the answer. I think that's a great question of how you're going to adjust your these initiatives like open streets that you put in place. How can we, you know, just kind of change temporarily the infrastructure of an open street or, you know, a offering of a park to make it uh, maybe, I don't know, some sort of large enclosing or something for people that are going to go attend and visit those spaces. But I think that we're going to face a lot of what we faced back in March, which was 
you have to stay home. And we haven't quite seen what the alternative is because we haven't gotten there yet. Right. And that, of course, doesn't take into account the, uh, you know, the, the, the progress of science. You know, hopefully by March, we'll have a little bit more progress on everything from testing uh, to a vaccine to therapeutics, where, you know, if there is a, a way that you can uh, blow into a tube and it turns green for 24 hours and you wear that around your neck to show that you don't have COVID, then maybe that's what it takes to get into a restaurant. I mean, innovations like that will have to happen. I think, and, and I'm hoping they could happen by March. So whether people are comfortable taking a vaccine early or not, if there's easy, easy to af and affordable, um, you know, testing that's out there, uh, I think that could change a lot as well. Yes, definitely. Um, and it's it's interesting for those who haven't been in New York City probably over the last month or two. Um, I live in the Upper East Side, and you can see even down Second Avenue, which is one of the kind of primary restaurant streets, like all the restaurants have started to construct these entire units of outdoor seating um, that are like a lot more permanent. So I think it'll be interesting to see how they start to put heating installations, et cetera, um, in it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the next question here is specifically relating to kind of entertainment within cities. I know, Kristen, you talked a little bit about it for Nashville and cities like that, uh, that, um, mm -hmm. you know, thrive really on their artistic culture and all of that. Um, you know, how, how do you see these kind of organizations still being able to thrive um, you know, such as like a Broadway or something like that, that really needs people in person um, or, or traditionally has needed people in person. I think we're seeing, you know, virtual capabilities really expand and increase during this uh, coronavirus. You know, right now we're sitting on a virtual webinar. Um, a lot of events have gone virtual. A lot of the concerts I've been tuning into virtually. Um, I think being able to monetize that those opportunities and really build out infrastructure and capabilities so that they can bring in hundreds of people at a time is going to be crucial. But that's really where I think the entertainment industry is going to lie is in these virtual offerings until we can get back to a point where people can be in a crowd. But if you think of the last concert you might have gone to, you're standing shoulder to shoulder with someone. So being able to having a less people in that room would be almost a weird experience. And so it's definitely going to be an interesting uh, shift to what's next. And I think, you know, technology and digital capabilities are going to be crucial in that. Absolutely. Um, so kind of building off of that question, someone had asked a lot of cities such as New York City that traditionally, um, you know, depend on international tourists. Obviously, there's a lot of travel restrictions and that's not very possible. Um, how do you think cities will be able to recoup some of that money uh, and be able to still kind of sustain themselves without that in the near future? I, I, I don't think it's recoupable. I think some cities like Las Vegas right, which are basically 100% driven by tourism and hospitality, you know, and a lot of it's driven by international spending, they're just not going to, it's going to be a different city coming out of this, mm -hmm. uh, because with, without that international travel, I mean, international spending, the, you know, the, the boom in Las Vegas, for example, of the casinos and the restaurants and nightclubs over the last five years, 10 years has been dramatic. And now you're, you're seeing a drop of anywhere between 50 to 80% in revenue that's coming in over the rest of this year. I just don't know how you recover from that. I think it's going to take a very long time. Certain industries that are dependent upon tourism and hospitality, you're really looking at it probably a recovery period of four to six years uh, mm -hmm. before they come back to it. Almost like how long it took downtown New York to recover after 9-11. You're going to see something similar actually happen, even though it's a wholly different event. And you'll start to see cities sort of shift what they're known for to tourists. So we did yeah. a piece on Orlando, which is known as an entertainment and family city with SeaWorld and Disney World and Universal there. There are hundreds of thousands of people out of work. And now we're starting to see those workers are going to companies like Amazon, which is opening locations there and other um, you know, retail right. and manufacturing opportunities. And so we might just see you know, where hospitality and entertainment lit like is focused shift from city to city or be more spread out instead of concentrated in one city and having the entire economy of that city sitting on it. Um, so yeah, I, Orlando comes to mind when I think of that because it's not going to be the same after coronavirus there. Definitely. Um, Matt, question for you. People are kind of curious to, to learn a little bit about what the Suzy audience is and kind of the people that are answering, um, you know, the data that's fueling this. Sure. So for this study, I mean, the Suzy audience, audience is mapped to U.S. Census amongst a variety of base census criteria. 
But for this study specifically, we talked to urban dwellers uh, in major cities, a thousand uh, urban dwellers. I think we covered the uh, exact cities at the beginning of the study. So we did not talk to people who live in suburbs or rural areas for this particular study, but it doesn't mean we can't with our tool. Definitely. Um, a question for you. So I know we talked a lot about kind of mid-tier cities uh, and kind of how, how they're continuing to rise. Have you guys seen any examples uh, of how these cities are starting to kind of boost their capabilities to start to prepare for that? Chris, you want to take that? Sure. I think sort of back on that conversation about um, bridging the digital divide and putting a lot of infrastructure and investment into, um, you know, internet and broadband uh, capacity, I think is going to be crucial for mid-tier cities. Um, it's it's impossible to have all these people moving in to work remotely if you don't have the internet and the infrastructure for them to do so. And I think that's really going to be key right now. So much of our changes and where we want to live are dependent on that technology being available. Um, and so that's really going to be the key thing that cities are looking to do in attracting uh, new folks and getting ready for them um, during all this shift. Absolutely. Definitely. A lot of these secondary cities were, you know, experiencing a dramatic increase in their population and, and, you know, more companies were moving there prior to this. So I think, again, if we can spread out the opportunity and the population density across other cities across America, it could really be a great thing because there are many great American cities that were crumbling uh, because their legacy businesses were no longer applicable in this new world. And you started to see a lot of economic demise and rising crimes. I mean, there was a, there's two worlds going on and we're seeing obviously play out in the political landscape, right? Not everything is like Seattle and Los Angeles, and New York, right? There are these cities in the middle of America that were really struggling. And if those cities can become revitalized uh, through this, then it could be one of the positives that come out of this. I think one important thing for, for people to know and understand is when the federal government issued CARES Act funding, um, cities only got funding if they are were populations of 500,000 or more. There are about 19,000 cities in the U.S., only 30 about are 500,000 or more. Right. And so right now, we a lot of cities, um, you know, no cities in South Carolina, for instance, even got any money. And so it's really crucial for, as I mentioned before, that funding to come in to be able to actually make any of these changes or improvements. Um, and that's really going to have to be the first step before we can see any result. Absolutely. Cool. Definitely. Um, okay. I think so we'll take one more and then we'll wrap it. Definitely. Um, so maybe a question for you, Matt. Uh, what do you think are probably the biggest opportunities for brands who are starting to think about um, planning marketing for 2021 um, and how that kind of intersects with like the shift uh, nature of cities? So, I mean, I think, and we covered this on, on past webinars, but ultimately, you know, brands right now are more trusted in many instances than the government, right? Uh, you know, the, our established brands in America are ones that consumers look to for guidance and leadership and issues that go far beyond the product or service that they sell. So I think moving forward now more than ever, brands have to continue to put out content to help consumers get through this in the categories that they can speak to um, and build trust. And at the same time, if they wanna to continue to drive their business, continue to shift the way they go about selling their product or service to this new world, knowing that consumers are gonna be less comfortable going to physical retailers for some time, knowing that consumers are less likely to jump in a car and drive somewhere, and they're going to want things delivered to their doorstep. So I think businesses have to act quickly uh, to add value as well as change your business model to make their products uh, easier um, to sell and, and buy in that regard. So I think ultimately it's oversimplifying it, but I don't think businesses have any choice. Cool. Well, thank you, Abel, for joining. Um, this has been a really fascinating uh, webinar. I want to thank Kristen from Smart Cities Dive for joining. Kristen, obviously, you know a ton about this topic, and uh, we're thrilled we had the opportunity to get you on board, and hopefully we can do more with you guys in the future. Uh, so thank you for joining. Uh,
Um, and Abel, thanks uh -huh. as always for uh, all your support and bringing this together. Uh, I'm Matt Britton of Suzy. If you have any questions about the study, uh, about our Suzy tool, or about the topic of the future of NYC, uh, you can email me directly at mattb.suzy.com. So I hope no matter where you guys are, whether you're out in the middle of the country, where you're in a suburb, suburb or you're in the middle of a big city, that you're staying safe and uh, enjoying this uh, last month of summer to come in August. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all in a thriving metropolitan area sometime soon. But until then, uh, stay safe. So on behalf of myself, Matt Britton, uh, Kristen from Smart Seas Dive, my colleague Abel, thanks so much for joining. Uh, and we'll see you next time.